Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 216 for Monday, June 24th, 2019. <music> Greetings, folks. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. As usual, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here, a little ticked off in Las Gatas, California. It's Paul Kent. <laughs> I think I know what topic we're starting with, Paul. What, uh, <laughs> what's got you ticked off today? We, I do want to say that we have a, a cool little gadget that Kevin mentioned and uh, a topic about tempos that we promised last week. But go. What's going Thank on, you. man? Yeah. So um, I had a gig, a pretty long standing gig. I'd been there about a year and uh, it was a Monday night gig. So it wasn't like, you know, the yeah. biggest gig that I do. And it wasn't the most, you know, the most, but it was a regular gig. It was a regular gig. And it was always kind of a weird gig in that the booking person w- would never share their phone number. They uh, were strangely selective. How did you get in touch with this person? Email. Oh, okay. All right. So you had a way, just not not an not a synchronous way. It was asynchronous right. communication. Got it. Yeah. And um, when she booked us, she would come by and she was fine. The place had some strangeness to it. Um, you know, at least half the time our payment wasn't ready at the end of the gig, and they would say, "Well, you'll have to come back and get it." Right. And that got kind of old. That gets old. Um, yeah. My impression was the woman who was booking us, she was nice. I don't think she wanted to do it. I think it got added to her plate. And from all indications, you know, she was like something else added to her and she wasn't particularly happy. But, you know, she and I had a pretty good rapport. Sure. Again, she would eventually return my emails. And it actually got to the point where she booked Simon and I for the rest of the year. First and last Monday of the month for the rest of the year. Paid decently, no tips at all. It's kind of a big open space. A lot of students are there kind of studying and, you know, taking, you know, meetings or study groups, that type of thing. You were there. You've, you've seen the place, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had a little meet up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, very kind of like almost felt like a, a food, like a, a, a different take on a food court. For for lack of a better term to everybody here, but lots of open seating spaces and various different places where you could get food or, you know, drinks or whatever. And right. uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a gathering place. Yeah, it was a gathering place. And yeah, um, so anyway, the, yeah, it's still the first place. part of the story <clears throat> is that, you know, my impression was the woman who booked us didn't really want to do the job. She wasn't terribly on top of it. You know, all of a sudden there would be long gaps as gaps in uh in her response time. Sure. But then, you know, I, I, we did a good job there and she booked us, you know, from June until the rest of the year, twice a month. So we show up for a gig during the sports playoffs, uh, uh, a sharks playoff game, big one. And they're having an event there. So they're, they're it's a, like you said, it's a gathering place. They're having an event. We show up and they're setting up a bunch of extra AV and big screens. And, you know, a lot of people are there. Not for and you. They didn't bother. Right. No, no, no. And they didn't bother to tell us. But we walked in and uh, they said, oh, you know, yeah, we got this event going on today. You guys just play, you know, from your normal start time to the start of the game. So that was, you know, maybe a half hour. And then go ahead and play between the periods, which, you know, was two, two 15 minute breaks. So say 20 minutes of pop. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Right. So that happened. And then a couple of weeks later, again, there's another. Um, uh, playoff game, a Warriors playoff game, not a big event like they did for the Sharks playoff game, but a, another big, another event. And we show up and another guy comes up and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, we're booked. And he goes, well, we're having an event. I said, but we're booked. And he introduces himself as the new manager. And we have um, a little bit of a chat. And I said, well, last time this happened, this is what they told us to do. Do you want us to do that? And, you know, we kind of chatted. It was there was a little bit of I'm the new sheriff in town yep. tone coming. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I wasn't I didn't know him. See, I wasn't certainly wasn't looking for a for a disagreement with the guy. Sure. And I was like, well, what would you like us to do? And, and so he goes, well, go ahead and play, you know, same as last time, you know, just to let you know, uh, I'm the new manager. Uh, and in the future, we don't know what we're going to do with the rest of these playoff games because both the Warriors and the Sharks were in the playoffs. Sure. And so we may cancel them. I say and I said to him, well, 
you know, they're confirmed gigs for us. That's pretty short notice. We wouldn't have time to rebook those dates. And he said, you know, we'll pay you for, you know, anything we cancel on short notice. I was like, okay, cool. That Great. works for me. That's right. Yeah, it anyway. couldn't be any more fair. That's right. Right. He says, uh, can you send me your confirmation of bookings for the rest of the year? And I dig up the email where me and the previous manager had agreed and I sent it to him and I don't hear anything from him. Yep. There had been an assistant manager who was really friendly and really helpful. Usually the guy who paid us on the nights when they didn't, when they didn't have the check ready, when we came back, he was usually the guy who would get us a check and apologize and that type of thing. And he informed me after a couple of times of trying to get an answer uh, that they had retained the services of a booking agent uh, who was going to be doing the booking. And I actually tangentially knew the guy because he's in the area here and started a, a email thread with him and he was responsive and it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and he, but he was clearly not getting answers from the new management about what they were going to do and times clicking up to another gig date. And so I was, I was persistent, but I would, I would say I was professional about it. I was like, you know, Hey, the date's coming up. We really need to know. Here's what the, here's what the, the previous manager said, I provided the booking guy, the confirmation email, you know, just really trying to move this along. And then I got an email last Thursday that said, hey, Paul, I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened, but the new manager has asked me not to book you. He said, um, you know, you, you had a gig at uh, during one of the playoff games and you just sat around and then you left without telling anybody, which absolutely was not. And then he said, and also, you know, the new management feels they're not bound to honor the obligations of the previous management. And that was, you know, even more of a red flag. Yeah. So it was a, it was a pretty disappointing email. And I was like, you know what, dude? I've provided you the confirmation of bookings. Here's the name of the manager who told us exactly what to do, you know, on those two playoff games. Clearly those guys are not talking or they're being duplicitous. And I had one more gig booked in June and I said, dude, clearly this is not a good deal. I'm, I'm going to give you back the date that I have with you. And uh, we're not even going to talk about things moving forward. And he was like, I'm really sorry about this. You know, I don't, I don't know what's going on. So this is the booking agent, right? Yeah. But then I thought about it and you know, Reputations are important. Those things are important to me. And so I posted a, a reasonably innocuous note on Facebook that said, hey, everybody, Simon and I won't be performing at this venue anymore. There's new management that I don't quite see eye to eye with. And life is too short to kind of put up with some things. All my musician friends, just beware if you're going to go into this venue. So that's part one of the story. So okay. net, 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 it's a new management who... I, my read was it that it was a new sheriff in town type of vibe. Just saying we are under no obligation to honor the obligation honor the commitments of previous management. That's a little weird, right? I mean, there's definitely a more professional way to do it. Yeah. So anyway, I post this on Facebook. I get I get a lot of feedback, a lot of musicians saying good for you, and then the behind the scenes um, messages start coming. You know, who is it? What's a, what's going on? And that type of stuff. And one of my friends, who's a working musician in the area, he said, you know. Between you and I, you're not the first one to have an issue with this new management. You know, even the old management was hard to get a hold of, which, you know, I, I found sure. to be true as well. But um, yeah, this new management, you know, one guy was told that his night was going to be canceled so they can get someone to better draw. You know, again, their option to do it, just how you do it is what, you know, what the issue is. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It, yeah, and, yes, business is business, right? But, but also people are people. And yeah. sometimes you need to separate uh, in fact, I think you always need to separate what the business needs from how you deal with the people that are affected by what you're what the business needs. Right. I I, I mean, you, you know, I, I deal with this in other aspects of my life, too, where sometimes, you know, company A doesn't need to work with me, company B. Right. And and maybe we've had a relationship and in, in the past and maybe we will again in the future. But. When, you know, the representative of company A, I get that the two companies like there is not a fit now. Great. No problem. Understood. But like you said, it's how you approach this. And if if company A's representative just like cuts off all contact, well, that's one way of doing it. And then there may not be any interest in a future relationship <laughs> down the road. But it, it can also be handled acknowledging the fact that, look, yep, we've got these two business ventures that aren't compatible right now, but we are human beings and we can have a conversation and I can say, Hey, you know, if it's company A, they can call up and say, Hey, you know, 
It's not going to work out this time. I'm really sorry that it's working out this way. Uh, I want to treat you right. I mean, like there's the human aspect of it in any kind of business. And of course, you know, playing music is in this case very much a business. Uh, And then you wouldn't be necessarily. Well, you wouldn't be telling other people about it, at least not in this light. And chances are you wouldn't be hearing back from other people saying you're not the first. Right. That's right. So I, I actually took a, a kind of a calculated gamble on this. So let me finish the thought on the, sure. on the on the background notes. And one of them that was particularly interesting was a guy who's a working musician here. He actually has been a union musician here. And he said, what happened? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, you're not the first. Right. And then I he goes, good for you, you know, for for standing up. And, um, you know, but unfortunately, there'll always be some and he used the word scab who in quotes doesn't need the money that will take gigs like that, that screw us all. Right. Which is an ongoing conversation that you and I have on the show all the time. The the term scab was kind of interesting. And again, I know the guy was in the local (laughs) musicians union, Yeah, but then from that, so that's, that's chapter two. So the coda to all this is I was reflecting on, I did something that I remember clearly I would never have done in the past. I would never have said no, thank you to a gig or, or, you know, just, you know, not, not how can I fix this? How can I make this right? You know, like right. once he called out, don't, don't call Paul Kent, but no, you know, I, I guess enough years, enough time. And now there's a booking agent who, you know, could be of use to me in the future, in the middle of all this. Yeah. And so I actually took a calculated gamble that a, that a professional response. And I'm hoping I'm still in the realm of professional, right? I did put it on Facebook. Yep. And I actually, I actually told the booking agent, actually, that was my response when this first happened. I said, listen, I gave you guys the proof of the press bookings. Here's the name of the manager who approved our time on the two playoff games. Um, you know, there's something else going on here. And I know the guy who owns your building. I'm going to send him a note as well. Mm. And um, who owns the, the venue. Right, right, and, right. Uh, and, you know, I did this because, listen, A, I think it's good for musicians to say, you know, bad behavior is not cool. In hindsight, could I have said it? You got, you guys sure you don't want to sit down and talk about this and, you know, figure out if there's a there there. But I was so ticked off that he said, don't, you know, told this booking guy, don't, don't book Paul Kent. And he gave him a bunch of wrong information. Right. So anyway, and then, like I said, the, there's a lot of musicians who are like, yeah, screw them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And but there were also a couple of musicians say, hey, tell me what you did, because I'm going to call the guy and try to get a gig for myself there now. Sure. If they're changing over people. And I'm like, really? You want to have that conversation with me right now? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I'm the guy that just went on Rage Book and ranted about right. this thing. You sure you want to get like, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, but net net, I, I wanted to keep, you know, I, I it was calculated with this booking guy in between that, listen, I'm a business person too. I'm not just some hack junior musician scab, you know, who, who, if someone's going to be that way and, you know, he knows that he was not getting back to me and, and, and booking dates were coming. And, um, he also knows that my band does pretty well in this area and that, sure. you know, we we could be of use to him in certain things. Yep. So there's a lot of, like everything, there's a lot of shades of gray. There's a lot of, um, um, there's multiple, uh, facets to the conversation. Of course. I feel good. I feel good. I'm talking about it right here. I feel good that I let other musicians in my area know. I do think that, that you know, for whatever's left of live music, um, musicians create the reality that they want. And, you know, tone matters and respect matters and professionalism and business-like attitude matters. But um, I think in this case, like I said, I didn't get the vibe that there was an opening to have that conversation with the new manager. and. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to let that gig go. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, if, if your gut says no, don't do the gig. Right. Like that to me, my gut has been right about more things than my brain ever has, uh, especially those kind of interpersonal things. Like you get a feel for something. It's just like, oh, well, got to walk away now, whether or not it, I, I, I totally understand why you went to Facebook and, and why you're talking about it here. Um, at, there is a there is another way to look at that, right? Like rarely is justice served in business, right? Or, well, let me let me say this another way. Rarely do you get both justice and desired outcome, 
Right. And in this case, maybe you maybe you do. Maybe you don't. You don't you won't know for probably a couple of years. Right. Like, do, is, are there repercussions from the ripple effect of of talking about this and, and in the ways that you have? Right. Do is there somebody out there that's like, oh, I don't want to I don't want to deal with someone that's going to like go and do that. And, and to be fair, you don't want to deal with someone that's going to go and do what this guy did. Right. So that's true. Yep. Um, I have found, you know, we, we, I run a sales business and I have found, um, as soon as a new buyer is in place, like, especially where there's an existing relationship, the first thing that this, this happens more often than not, if you just try to leave things alone, this happens more often than not. Like somebody has got like an ad campaign going or a series of bookings going, right. It's the same kind of thing. That someone else decided, right? They've inherited this. Even if it's the best thing for the business, it's not theirs. They have no emotional ownership over it. They want to, like, part of the reason that they see why they're in there is to make changes, right? And do something different and and put their own stamp on things. Even if the best thing for the business is, you know, what's already going on. So, what we have found is as soon as there's a new buyer um, and this is I'm saying with the sales business, but I've, I've definitely done this with the band, too. As soon as there's a new buyer, manager, whatever, if you've got that existing relationship, you know, there's six more gigs on the calendar or even three gigs on the calendar. I, I am always proactive about it. I get on the phone like, hey, new manager. Great. You know what? Let's talk. I know we've got these gigs here, but I want to work with you. And what I usually try to do, unless there's some angle to make it better, what I usually try to do is get that person to decide that the current scenario is the right scenario. And now they've got ownership over it. Right. But and 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 sales, I, I always say this and salespeople think I'm crazy, but sales and ego don't mix. Like if, if you want to be right, then you aren't going to do sales. And if you want to do sales, then then you have to let the other person be right. And uh and so that's my job is to go in or our job is to go in and and make sure that whoever it is that's that's doing the buying feels like they made the right decision. And an inherited decision is rarely one that they feel any attachment to whatsoever. So it's really easy for somebody to say, oh, yeah, that, well, that was the, the last guy. You know what? Screw it. I've got an idea. Let's do this. And and so, it, you know. If it were a scenario, if somebody listening finds themselves in a scenario like this where you've got some gigs booked and, you know, a new manager, booking agent, whatever steps in, be the first person to get them on the phone and talk it through. Now, you may find out that they're a total you know, jackass to begin with and you don't want to deal with them and then you can walk away. And that may well have happened in this scenario, like regardless of how the interaction happened, it might have turned out that this is just a bad fit. But. Uh, it, you get to be more in control if you call that person and and tell them you want them in control, uh, as opposed to just holding the line with no, this is our arrangement, it must be honored. That kind of thing rarely goes over well um, when somebody new comes in, and it's just, like I yeah, said, let me give you found on the on the sales I, side. I, everything you say, everything you say, I absolutely agree with, and you know, the issue of ego, and and that's why I was kind of reflecting. Like, I know musicians who. Yep have put up with enough stuff. And at the first sign of conflict, yep. they're ready to say the heck with this. Like, you know, if it's not a great paying gig and it's just another one of those gigs, the, the color here that matters a lot is this is a venue that doesn't know what they're doing with regards to music. They sure. hire people and they have music. They're not a music venue. And you've been there. Like I told you, we kind of get stuck in the corner and yep. it was a Monday night gig for me. It was fine. So, um, the long-standing history. Now we have two managers that are kind of bumbling right. music, right? Right. And so it, it is a, it is a, you have to see it for what it is, right? It's a place that likes the idea of music. Um, you know, for me, especially on a Monday night, there wasn't a lot of pressure for a draw. So you could just show up and play your, play your show. Right. And that was okay. That's good. Yeah. But I, I know that the Friday and Saturday night when they would have full bands there, there was some pressure for a draw. And like I said, I had this one friend who ran, who ran a jam night there. And, but again, if you, if you add in the non-responsiveness to booking inqu inquiries or spotty responses, sure. the, the questionable paying activities, right? Sometimes your check was there. Sometimes your check wasn't there. Yep. The, the, we don't have any obligation with regards to past, right? 
I don't think at a very senior level, they talk much about music other than probably the owner says, hey, hey it'd be nice to have music. I yeah, mean, you should I book some bands. Like that. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you know, let's let's make let's liven it up here. It's an afterthought. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and that's actually where the nuance of all this is. I mean, all, all the emotion aside, the true problem there is that it uh, and you, you we find this like when bars take real estate and put a stage in the corner and and want bands that draw and, you know, the band is part of their business equation. That's a different type of discussion on many levels. Yeah, it's often this a is, failed model. If if you're relying on uh, if you're living and dying by every night's booking, you're in the wrong. Like, that's not the right way to run a bar. I, I agree entirely. My point more, though, is that that is at least someone who who wants to have at some level. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're going to pay attention. It, right. Yeah. If it's yeah. a bar that just says, hey, you didn't draw your out, you know, and, you know, it, it doesn't matter that it was a Wednesday night, you know, and it's snowing outside and all that type of stuff. <laughs> But yeah, the yeah, point fair. of this is the, the warning signs are are there. They're mm-hmm. they're you know bad communication, not a lot of attention, not a lot of attention to pay in promptly. Um, you know, just a general attitude towards look, we're hiring you to stand in the corner and make some noise. You know, to to take up some space. That's understand yep. that gig for what it is. Yeah, it you might take, be a and gig know for you. that it won't last. It doesn't. It know that it doesn't matter. To the overall success of the place, whether it lasts or not, that's right. probably a that, better way to say accurate. it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You got to you got to know what the gig is. That's true. That's true. Yeah. You don't get to choose how uh, places are managed, but you do get to choose where you play. And you mm-hmm. don't have to say yes when someone invites you to play, especially. And that really gets the whole conversation back around to the beginning. Right. Yep. I mean, that's what I was saying. This is this is. And when my friend said in quotes, who don't, who doesn't need the money. And we've actually had this conversation in a few different ways here. Yeah. That's really what's at issue here. I mean, it, at least at this venue, that's what is at issue here. And it, you know, it's, it's the talk about a vibrant music scene. I mean, people certainly play for free in Nashville who are wildly talented and are, are just trying to get noticed. And that's what the game is there. There's even pay for play in Nashville, as I understood it. As, as, I mean, as was explained to us by, uh, by Buddy Gibbons when he was exactly. on the show and he left Nashville because part, greatly in part because of that. Yes. Right. Yep. And he went to LA where he could actually play and, and be around like, you know, the cream of the crop players. So, yeah, this is why that conversation should and rightfully should come around again and again and again. The guy who says, I just do it, you know, for my own personal enjoyment. It's not quite that simple. It's really not that simple at all. It's, you know, you're part of an ecosystem that is uh, there's some people who are vested professionals, put a lot of time into it, you know, put a lot of time into gear, a lot of time into perfecting their art, a lot of time to being good. And, you know, if you're a guy who doesn't do that and just wants to get up and, and play for your friends and family once in a while, that's that's an interesting thing, right? So, yeah, you know, maybe these types of venues that don't care, those are the right places. Maybe those, those are the things. right places for that. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, if you're I feel give yourself permission to say no in scenarios like this, if you see that it's well, I'd just, say that the, you know, the, the band who said to me, hey, if you're not going to be played there, can I take your spot? I will never refer anything to that guy ever, 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 <laughs> right. ever, ever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, of course not. And that's the other thing is, is remember, you know, there, there are consequences to every action, right? Some positive, some negative, but, but generally speaking, when you're interacting with other humans, there's going to be, you know, the, the, the grand sum total of the things that you do is going to be considered uh, as people decide how and where, and if uh, they want to work with you. And yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. I'm less angry now. Good. That, well, you know, that we grind axes here sometimes, so it's <laughs> fine. You know, it's good. All right. No, let's talk about stages. It's good. Yeah. So Kevin sent us a thing. He said, uh, have either of you heard of my stage? Uh, it's on a it's a Kickstarter right now. He says, I've been eyeballing it since it first uh, got some press. Now it looks like they're ready to start pr- producing. I'm curious enough that I'm buying one. But given how much you both dig into gear, I was wondering if either of you uh, have come across it or anything like it. And yeah, this um, this thing is pretty cool. I'm I'm pulling up the link here now, but it's I, a, I will tell you, I checked it out and I signed stage. up for it. OK, yeah, but I was inundated. I mean, the strategy was like, you know, 
he created this kind of weird false scarcity in the beginning and I've gotten about 20 emails. Mm. So, so it just had to come red flags that it was that anyone that's trying that hard makes me, makes me concerned. I know there's that Intel stage that our buddy, Dan Meblin talked it, about. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, but this is supposedly this, much less, this one's lighter. much lighter. This is a four by four stage. So not enough to be a drum riser. You really need five by five, maybe even five by six to get a, a, you know a, a drum set up on on something right. reliable you could put two of these next to each other as long i don't know that there's a way to link them together uh although it looks like they do they have two of them next to each other so maybe there is a way to link them together but it looks like people are just placing them next to each other i don't know about you drummers out there but i ain't gonna sit on some right. portable thing that's two separate pieces that yeah. might split. Yeah. And I got other go things. To, I got, yeah, yeah, I got other things to worry about. Yeah. That, and that ain't one of them, but, uh, but maybe they've, maybe they've solved that problem or maybe it is linkable in a way that um, it's not entirely clear here, but uh, Kevin said he was going to buy one, right? Oh, you can link together as many platforms as needed. So, okay. So maybe there's like some edging to it that, that kind of hooks together or something like that. So, okay, that's good. But they say it's, it's super light. They show a guy walking around with, uh, with two of them on his shoulder and he doesn't look like the, you know, he looks like, he looks like your, your average guitar player would look not your average, you know, muscle bound, you know, guy that, that just walked out of the gym. So <laughs> they say it's five times lighter. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. You get, um, I'm looking here 259 for one of them and 518 for two. And then you can get six of them for 1500 bucks. So the, the, you know, the per unit price goes down a little bit, but that's, it's interesting. I, you know, I like the idea of a portable riser of sorts. Um, do you guys use anything like this in, uh, in the house rockers? Like when you play your gigs, like on the beach or whatever, do you bring your own staging or do you only use whatever staging is, is provided for you. So a long time ago, Bill built us a drum riser. Oh, nice. Two, okay. Two, two, um, but he made it out of plywood. It's big, it's heavy, it's bulky. It's hard to, it's hard to move. It takes up a lot of room in our trailer and it's two parts that kind of bolt together and it's really solid. Got it. Um, one of the parts actually can serve as a, as a, um, horn riser when we need it. Oh, nice. So, yeah, so we do have something. It's not practical and it's really bulky and it's a pain in the butt to move sure. around. Yeah. And, you know, whenever, when Meblin was telling us, you know, that it is a new, another thing he can offer, you know, he's, he's got a band, he's right. got sound, he's got lights, he's got stage, you know, the things that are typically needed for an event, he can charge for and yeah. sell, right. uh, makes a lot of sense. And again, if this, my red flag was that I got so many emails and a lot of them were like last chance, you know, get in while you can, you know, they were, they were kind of hard sells. Yep. So I kind of turned it off, but I think Kevin who sent us uh, the inquiry, I think he said he's buying them. So yeah. hopefully he'll send us his, his feedback on it. You know, it seems to make sense again, especially if it's easy to get around Yeah. to have a drum riser would just add that amount of professionalism and, you know, be really great. So it sounds like you'd need two of these, right? At least two a for riser. a drum riser. But I feel like if you got three of them, you could probably like, I'm thinking for fling four feet's a little shallow for me. I'm a six foot three drummer. I generally need five feet between the back of my stool and the front of my kick drum like that. That's you go eight across by by one by you'd make a triangle. Basically, I, I'd have to make a triangle. Yeah. But but yeah. two of how them one, or three of them next to each other. Uh, two fifty is their yeah. their their Kickstarter pricing. Yeah. So a thousand bucks for four of them is is what it comes down to. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And they do have a drum set. Well, they have a drum set set up sort of um actually in a way that might work it, it's coming out of the corner like they have the stool in the back corner of this thing so depending on how you set up your drum set you might be able to fit a drum set on two just not straight out which sometimes is a better way to set up anyway but three of them i feel like like for fling we could put drums and keys up on this thing or drums and one other instrumentalist you know up on this thing and and have mm -hmm. like a two-tiered kind of setup so yeah an adjustable height, three inches uh, to 18 inches is what you get to pick. So somewhere, you know, that's that's not bad. 18 inches is I, I would say 18 inches is taller than I would generally want to go with a drum riser. That's that's really high 
for a drum riser. That's like a, you you've probably seen bands in arenas that don't use an 18 inch drum riser. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, of course, you've probably seen some that use a four foot drum riser, but that, you know, that's different. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty good. I like it. All right. Well, hopefully Kevin will send in some notes about when he when he gets one and puts it to use. How, yeah. How, uh, how sturdy it is and how useful it is. And yeah, it's pretty cool. I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com is how you can uh, how you can get in touch with us. And we would love to hear from you because we love hearing from you. That's really what it comes down to. I wanted to talk about tempos. So uh, I noticed something at the last Uptown Celebration gig. We've played enough gigs that we're comfortable with each other. We feel like a band on stage, but we haven't played enough for this particular band for tempos to be locked in. And part of that is we just don't play frequently enough. But part of it is that different people in the band have different ideas of where the groove should be for a song. Because I routinely have one of our singers telling me, you know, slow down or speed up. And our bass player also telling me slow down or speed up. But it's it's different directions in most of the time. So it it's it's an interesting issue. Right. So I'm I'm curious in like th- th- there's different ways to solve this problem in uh, it, a lot of times it gets solved organically, right? You just, you play enough with each other that you sort of learn where the, where the time should sit. Doesn't mean that it's always perfect that whoever's going to count it off is, is going to get it, you know, in exactly the same spot every time, but you have, you know, your comfort zone for your band and, and that can work. Uh, the complete flip side of it is playing to a click track, right? Where tempos are pre-decided and thou shalt not change, you know, uh, and you're just locked in. And I guess middle ground is having, uh, you know, a click or something to give you a reference point to start the tune and then just count in from there and, and let it go. And, and well, there's one other one. And and that's, is that uh, like what Russ does is he, he notates the correct beats per minute. Yeah. And then he takes a moment to kind of you know get acclimated to that. So yep. he, he does have a frame. Yeah, that's right. That's the other way. If you if yeah, if if whoever's counting the tune can can kind of feel, all right, yep, this is this is where 120 is, this is where 106 is, like that kind of thing. You can you can find those uh and and do it. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and that's so that's what you guys do in the house rockers. Um, so I count off probably 75%. So God. I, I have, I have the responsibility for that and I'm right about 75% of those 75% of the sure. time. So yeah, yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes I know we've listened to recordings and we're like, holy cow, we play that fast and it didn't feel fast at the time, but then you play it back and you can hear, we have a great gauge because we have a lot of like really complicated horn lines. There's a certain tempo at which the lines just aren't smooth and aren't clean. And so that's a, that's always a good, yeah. <laughs> a good, you know, signpost that that uh, we're messing it up. So I always have- think about the singer first, the horn. If there are horn players, the horn players second, and and then the the dancers third. And but depending on the 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 tune, I might think about the dancers first. Like if the singer wants to play, you know, uptown funk at a hundred beats per minute, it's like, no, 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 no. Like this, this needs to be, you know, at one twenty or whatever that, you know, wherever it needs to sit. Cause right. it's got to bounce. But it, where I say, I think about the dancers, it's if we're in, once a tune has started, if people are moving, there needs to be an emergency in order for me to change the, to, to decide to change the tempo. And if it's way too fast for someone to sing or someone to, you know, play their horn line to or whatever, I, I consider that, uh, you know, potentially an emergency depending on, you know, where we are and, and all of that. But if it's just like, Oh, this should be a little faster, man, or, Oh, this should be a little slower. It's like, okay, next time, you know, that's fine. Yeah. Like I'll make a mental note, but we're not going to mess with what's happening out there just to make somebody on stage feel a little better. And that includes me. Like if, it, if the tune just needs to sit and uh, unless well, I'm sure Russ is giving you the huzza huzzas right now, because that's true. I mean, that process of speeding a song up or slowing a song down mid song uh, is fraught with, with problems, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, the song never feels right to me as a drummer. If we have to speeding it up, if it needs to speed up a little bit, that can sort of happen. And in in fact, with some songs should happen naturally, right? Like a song like superstition should speed up 
all the way through, you know, uh, taking care of business, right? That song on the record, it speeds up all the way through. It's probably 10 beats per minute faster. September's another one that just keeps moving along because they're very repetitive tunes. So the way you build energy is by, by gradually, you know, speeding it up. You don't want to go too much more than like five or 10 beats per minute between the beginning of the song and the end of the song. But that can be a nice way to do it. Slowing it down, on the other hand, or or making those changes more more uh, it, you know immediate gradu- rather rather yeah. gradual. Oh man, I don't know. So this about is that. interesting to me because because you are saying something that I've always thought, but I but I hear a lot of people say is not. You're actually saying that there is nothing wrong. What is it? I think sing a song or one of the Earth, Wind, and Fire songs that we do on recording speeds up pretty much from the beginning to September. the end. September. It starts September. with... September. And as right. soon as the corns come in, and da, 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 it's five beats per minute. It changes right there every time. There you go. Yep. yep. But uh, I think what you're saying is that there's nothing musically wrong with that. If the if the gradual push of tempo supports the energy of the song, that's not a problem. Anybody that... I Yes, that's what I'm saying. And anybody that, that doesn't quite grok that yet, I will put a link in the show notes to Stevie Wonder on Sesame Street playing superstition it's probably 30 beats per minute faster at the end than it is at the beginning and it is a master class in exactly why speeding things up can yeah. work it's not true with every song like some tunes you know you're playing uh uh let's get it on no 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 like you got to hold that That's tight true. in the pocket yeah exactly it, it's you know different songs different things but you know try to play like the long and winding road it, that's at 60 beats per minute. I, I like I have yet to find a musician that can end that song at the tempo they started it. It is so hard not to speed that song up because there's so, so much we, space in it, you know, but yeah. we fooled around with uh, the Detroit medley for a long time. Uh-huh. So this is pretty, pretty much balls to the wall from the beginning to the end, but yep. it speeds up. And at the time, the guys I was playing with were like, oh, you know, how terrible is that? You know, the drummer couldn't hold the tempo. And I was like. It feels right, though. I mean, it you know it never feels weird that something changed. Is this a you know? Are we arguing splitting technical hairs here? But you're actually saying that that it's by design, and it it's 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 not a measure of technical a, a drummer's well, it time might be. I mean, it, it might be, uh, but but it, but there there is a a no pun intended time and a place to let the tempo go. Sometimes it can happen. It, it can and should happen intentionally. Like, like with superstition, I'm, I'm very aware playing that song that at every turnaround, we're going to, you know, we're going to add another BPM or two. It's just how it's going to go. And, th- and that's a mm. very intentional thing. Cause otherwise that song just kind of, it sits too deep in, in that pocket, you know, but um, well, think about the Detroit medley for a second, because that's actually yeah. a different situation than superstition because it's literally a medley. It's right. It's literally it's different tunes. It's three songs yeah. that are are linked together. And the net sum of the three songs is pushing it towards towards a conclusion that works really well for many people. Right. Right. So. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. No, I, I I'm a big uh, fan. And, and there are, look. I, I, this is not uh, Dave trying to pave the path for, you know, excuses down the road. There are times when I speed things up, you know, singing and playing was something that took me a long time to learn how to do in time. And there are times when I mess that up, you know, and I'll, I'll, I, I, if I start, if I'm, if it's a new song or whatever, like definitely I'll, even if I'm just singing harmonies in a chorus, like sometimes that will, that I will lose, lose sense of, of, locking the time in and it'll nudge up and it's like oh that wasn't intentional crap you know yeah that 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 stuff happens too um but but yeah no they there are times to let it go it's a device it, it's a device it's an energy device like yeah if if something's not going somewhere a lot of times i'll just be like all right you know what i i i have there's many tricks i have in the uh in, in the arsenal here and i'm gonna pull this one out and we're just gonna you know push on this a little bit and see what happens and sometimes you can push on it a lot and actually make it a thing and now the crowd's trying to keep up with the band trying to you know move things faster and that can actually be kind of a fun thing you get to the end of the song and you know it's it's like this shared crisis or whatever you know it's like wow that was really fast so yeah no but i so i'm wondering what to do in in uptown i mean it, i feel like at the next rehearsal 
I want to, I'm going to come in with, with tempos, not for every song, but for the problem songs and just talk them through and be like, okay, here's where these are going to be. And it's easy enough. I, I run the set list. Uh, you know, whenever Gary sends out the set list, I just put it on my iPad. So it's easy enough for me, like in Fourscore or any other app, but Fourscore makes it super easy to a- assign a, a visual click to a given song. And so I can have it, you know, just give me the 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 click and be like, okay, great. I can go from there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's an interesting thing, you know, with this band, it, you didn't have to go through it with Russ necessarily as much because you didn't change the person in the band that counts off every song. That's true. Right. You, you know, whereas Uptown did that because Jeff was, yeah. was counting in every song and it's like, yeah, I'll, I, I'll drive the bus, but you know, it's my foot on the gas. <laughs> like if you want me to go slower, we can talk about that after, but in the middle of the gig, mm, not probably not the right time, you know, uh, again, unless it's an emergency. I remember there was one, madhouse we had a five-piece horn section and uh and we were playing uptown funk and brandon my friend brandon who's the director of madhouse he never wants to be on stage but um but he likes everything faster he jokes about brandon's standard time which is you know about 10 beats per minute faster Mm -hmm. than than anything than anything that anyone else would ever choose and we're playing uptown funk and the where my drums were set up was such that i could see and wasn't really all that far. I was like up left, upstage left and right next to the wings of the stage. And so I look over at one point and I see Brandon over there, like doing his little moves to like get me to play faster. I'm like, no, dude, like I'm carrying five horns here. And those are like tight syncopated 16th notes that these guys got to play. Like, I can't do that. And he's like, no, it's got to be faster. It's got to be faster. I'm like, mm. no, 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 <laughs> no. Don't make me do this, man. <laughs> so, well, the flip side of it is. With the overcorrection, when something drags, it's pretty hard. But there's there's an interesting thing. There's 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 a reality when you are playing something too fast. Slowing down seems slow. Yes. And then there's past that. Then that's when it drags. When you have overcorrected. So you know, what Russ is really good at is he's he knows exactly where the right tempo is. Right? That's good. So he rarely overcorrects. Yep. Right. Um, but it right. feels like he is right to everybody on stage. Cause you're used to that, you know, adrenaline rush, especially if it's late in the show, but you know, but the interesting thing is when, when you have that exact, and the other point is sometimes the tempo on a re- original piece of music doesn't feel quite right in the hands of the cover band. You, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, Oh, Totally. Totally. I don't know what the science behind that is, but I mean, there's something where, you know, it feels like a drag or, you know, I know like for a lot of the tower stuff we do, some of the stuff we can't play at the, at the pace that, that the original yeah. is. I mean, we it just, we can't keep it tight and clean and it can't, and it doesn't groove at, you know, at, at what, at what tower does. Yep. So tempos are just are an interesting thing. It there's, is. Yeah. There's right. There's wrong. And there's, and there's a right lot of room us. in between. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. what works for us. Well, and that's, that's the thing is finding what works for your band. And what I'm finding in Uptown is I'm not sure they know what works for this band. You know what I mean? Like it's, it it's it, so, I mean, it's, it's just a conversation we'll have. It's an, it's an easily addressable problem. It just, I noticed it in, at the last, actually at the last two gigs, there was one, one tune I started too fast brick house. We were coming out of something, you know, we were finishing one song and Gary turned to me and he's like brick house. And I was like, Okay, like we, you know, and people were up and moving. It was like, got to keep it going. So I played the fill without first kind of taking a breath and finding the tempo. And Brickhouse is not up at like that typical 120. Right. And right. It, it, you know, I got that it. intro, it, depending on where you call for that song, if yeah. you've just done a bunch of like, like adrenaline induced songs, trying to bring it back to that place. That's kind of what I'm saying is, yeah. you know, some of it is, some of it is set choices, so set, you know, set list order. That is a perfect example because that is actually, it is a groove that has to be where it is for it to feel right. You can, you know, everybody loves the song and everybody knows the song. It was so you can fine, play it. faster. Yeah, our yeah. singer turned to me and he's like slower. I'm like, next time, but not yeah. now. Like they're already moving. I am I agree with you, but I'm not going there right now, you know, but we do. A- you hear that, Russ? Next time. <laughs> next time. Next time. Well, my guess, is, next time. my guess is, you know, you said when, when Russ slows it down to the right tempo, but it feels too slow. My guess is it feels too slow to him, too. I feel that way when I slow a song down, no matter where I'm coming from, like I can it's really hard to get my brain 
in the groove where I feel like I'm still driving it, but at the slower tempo. It's a it's a very it's a really weird mind shift. But that's the set list order thing. Yes. You know, like like yes. the way I write our last set is it starts at about an eight and it ends at about a 12 on a 10 scale, right? And yeah. and very clearly, if I put any one song in there that's gonna go down for some reason. It, it, it really has to have a, a real purpose for changing the mood of the set. But pretty much we're a, we're a sprint in that last set. You know, we start with, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Let's Go Crazy by Prince, right? Oh, yeah. And a good, a good example of a song that, that takes it to a, like, we'll put um, I Can't Go For That by Hall & Oates, you know, high up in our last set. As the change up. Um, yep. Yeah. And as there's just kind of different feel. Yep. And that's one little, you know, all right, we're done with the change of feel now. And then it's like, boom, all the way through. Uptown and, uh, does a cool thing. They, that they started doing before I joined, but I really like it. And it, it's a, it's a trick that works really well or a, a song pairing that works really well. We, we play September at basically at, at, you know, album tempo at, at the, the, you know, we start it at the five beats per minute, faster tempo. We don't speed it up in the intro, but, um, then we segue into we are family and it mm -hmm. and we we slow it down over the course of a measure only maybe four five six beats per minute or something but it's this perfect amount of just easing back into that we are family groove where you've got september is just like you know driving with that body you know and then it's just like right you know it, it it really kind of pulls in that 70s vibe of that that we are family mm -hmm. and we probably are playing we are family faster than we normally would because we're playing it out of september but just that little bit of slowdown the the people on the dance floor love it because they understand that something has changed but it's not so jarring that they have to stop moving you know it's just right. like oh what just happened and then you know it moves from from uh you know from marty singing it to rachel singing it and, and it's like oh right yeah okay this is cool you know it works really well and it's a fun i, I it's one of the moments i look forward to in our show every time because it's like oh yeah we get to we get to take the tempo and just grab hold mm -hmm. and pull it down in a comfortable way it's one of those few times where slowing down while i'm playing feels right and and so that's pretty cool you know yeah, i don't know it's it's just fun so but yeah, it's an interesting thing. I'd love to hear how you folks address tempos in your band, how you, you know, how you decide upon them and then how you execute in the moment and find out, you know, and make sure it's, it's what you want. Um, fling is fling is an interesting one. We um, Russ has a tendency to play fast, like really fast. Your Russ. Yes. My Russ, right. In fling. Yeah. Guitar player, uh, guitar players in general, I've found, uh, you do not, but uh, many guitar players have a ten more more often than not. A guitar, guitar players will have a tendency to to rush the the time, um, and bass players rush when they call when they call off a song or or rush the feel like in their solos in the middle of a song. Uh, rush their feel in the rhythms in the middle of ah. a song. Mo many right. more more often than not, guitar players will will drive hard. So I have to be careful in my ears how much rhythm guitar I get because if I'm if if I if that's the dominant thing that I hear, it, I, if I'm not paying attention, I will follow that and just get faster um, mm. with with guitar uh, more often than not. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, we'd like to hear about what you guys do. Feedback Please. at giggabpodcast.com. We uh, it's how it goes. You got anything else, man? No, we went a lot of places today. We I think uh, we can continue this conversation next time uh, from tempos to grooves like there are some. There are some grooves that are just tough cover band grooves to grok. We do. Um, well, save Michael it. Jack save it for the next time. Because that's, right. that's a, it, you, yep. you're totally right. It's the, yes. Tempo is part of groove, but it's not the entirety of it for sure. Right. Yep. Yep. Next time. <laughs> next time. All right. Well, let's groove. yes, well, let's groove <laughs> t tonight or that day or whatever. <laughs> whatever, night, whatever. Or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> whatever your tempo, though, you know what I say. Uh, what would you say? Whatever the tempo, always be performing. That's what you would say, isn't it? I knew you would say that. Freaking guitar players. <laughs>